We come to the earth which, well, grew to get here, the way it is now. Here is our world, our planet Earth, floating in space. We will be going backward in time, imperfectly, but done in a very disciplined manner. Please notice there is no subduction, no rotation of tectonic plates, no twisting, no form fitting, no altering shapes or sizes. It would be impossible, impossible for these continental plates to fit together perfectly without this being true, and yet the upper tectonic plates fit together perfectly on a much smaller planet. Yes, there's been some erosion, landslides, blah, blah, but overall, this activity is insignificant. There is a kind of conspiracy of silence among certain scientists. They know, but are not telling you, that the upper tectonic plates of Earth also join in the Pacific, not partially, they join totally. You are asked to believe that the continents swim or drift about willy-nilly, bumping and crashing as if they were on a grease skillet. This is not true. The simple truth is apparently too upsetting to too many apple carts. We're now going forward in time to show how the actual growth of the Earth took place. Imperfect as the details, but the overall is nailed. Antarctica as you see, has become subtropical. Africa on a smaller globe move way downward under the globe. In fact, for hundreds of millions of years, the bottom of Africa was the South Pole. South America's tail goes under and wraps around the bottom of Africa. Then incredibly, it joins coast with Antarctica. 65 million years ago and more, these continents were joined and marsupials like the duckbill platypus roam from Australia, Antarctica, and across southern South America and up into Africa, the platypus. Dinosaurs roamed all over this world on the upper tectonic plate because there were no oceans, just shallow seas. Here today, Antarctica is frozen over and Australia and its surrounding islands are the remaining home of marsupials. Do you see how broadly the Pacific is opening compared to the Atlantic? This is exactly why the knee-jerk Pangaea theory exists. The Pacific spread is too difficult to easily visualize because it's so big. The Atlantic spread is so obvious that a child would recognize it, but they are the same. Check this map out. The Navy and others took core samples to find the ages of the sea bottom. Lo and behold, no part of the undersea was found to be much older than 70 million years old. Does that shock you? It should. It shocked the scientists. Where do they get ancient fish fossils from? From the land, like in Mississippi and Utah and France and China. Most of the undersea wasn't there 70 or 80 million years ago. The measurements of the core samples give the age of the sea floor newest 10 million or so is red as we go back in time we go backward in our rainbow orange yellow green blue okay so we bury the new sea floor back to the fault lines as dictated by color or age 10 million years back these are the ages of the sea floor as measured by science and they're generally true earth grew 20 million I'm not making this information up. This map comes from the scientific community. 30 million. You can find the same map in many places on the internet. It's common knowledge. 40. The ocean bottom is from one year to 180 million years old. 50. 70% 70 of it is no older than 60 million years old. 60. The upper plate, the continents, are as old as 2 billion years old and more, 70, 10 to 20 times as old as the undersea plates. The undersea plate is new and spreading at the rifts. 
Why does the scientific community desperately cling to and promote the idea that the ocean bottom is sliding under the continents and into a magma which is twice as dense as solid granite? A totally unsupportable and scientifically unsound idea? They have to. Or else they'd have to observe and admit that the Earth is growing. And that, viewers, is a very big deal. That would change everything in science, from the smallest particle to the whole universe. 100 years of scientific theory out the window. That's a lot to give up. It's important to remember that science and the universe should and must be easier to understand as we go back in the universe's evolution. This is an undersea map. As a kind of test for ourselves, we deemed it important to show that not only the upper plate had to fit properly together, but the undersea had to spread in a logical, reasonable pattern that we could see and understand as rational humans. Do you see those lines in the undersea which, beyond information, show direction? The direction of movement apart and away from the rifts. In fact, it's like a movement diagram, isn't it? Ah, we're moving now. Let me point out that the newer undersea near the rifts is smoother and more regular than the older land further away from the rifts. Here in the Atlantic, the rift goes right up the middle. Half of the Earth's growth has happened since the extinction of dinosaurs. This means that the Earth is accelerating in its growth. In the last 65 million years, Earth nearly doubled in size. The last redoubling took 600 million years, at least. We're continuing all the indicated undersea directions, like following a blueprint. The Earth guides us. And now the land masses will come together. Perfectly. As we now go forward in time from 185 million years ago, please notice there is no subduction, no raising and lowering of land masses. There can't be. It's hell in the form of magma down there. Local raising and lowering, yes, but not on a massive basis. It can't happen. There's no turning, rotating of land masses. The land masses sit in their individual plates and don't move. The rifts open, that's all. For examination, I'm going to run a few vignettes of each area of Earth that you have a right to be curious about. The North Pole. Man, I love this map so much. There was a piece in the recent National Geo. It shows that the trees in Asia and North America were exactly the same trees. Well, this is why. The land was together when the trees evolved. The South Pole. The oceans have absolutely nothing to do with tectonic spreading, except that they cool the thickening mantle. Tectonic spreading, even according to the most conservative scientists, has created two-thirds of the Earth's surface in the last 200 million years. And therefore, the same, the same must be true on all planets, including Mars must. And we can see the younger spreads on Mars just as on Earth. But there is, just as clearly, no subduction on Mars. It can't be both ways. You either have spreading and subduction, or you have only spreading, and you must have spreading. Or, you can continue to ignore the facts and say, as the ancients said, that the Earth is unique and singular in the universe and that we are the center and the universe 
rotates around the Earth. Our Earth's moon, so familiar to us and yet so mysterious. Down here near the bottom, we find what is clearly an impact crater, and probably an historically recent one. Look at this crater's immense splash trails. This splash trail travels across the entire face of the moon, about the distance from Florida to New York. This is so an impact crater. Up here is another easily identifiable impact crater, but one on Earth, well, one on the moon, is this gigantic spread of flattened, slightly depressed land. We have a name for it. We call it Mare Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity. Exactly what is this gigantic spread as big as Iceland? And what is this spread, bigger than Europe? We call it Mare Ibrim. What about this gigantic spread area, as big as the United States? We call it Oceanus Procellarum, the Ocean of Storms. Fully one-third of the moon's near-side surface consists of these gigantic spread areas. Let's examine them more closely. We're often told that these are impact craters. This certainly could not be so. An impact crater of this size would have blasted the moon apart or at a minimum gouged gigantic chunks out of the moon. Look more closely at their size, at the lack of splash as with the true impact craters we saw moments ago. There is, in fact, no splash at all. Also notice that within these areas, there is a significant lack of craterization. There is some, but compared to the common surface, the craterization is insignificant. These areas are newer, fresher areas, more recently made. In fact, it's as if some spreading force pushed the regular surface slowly outward, pushed the old surface aside, and bunched up these surfaces along the edges of the spread's rims. Look at this bunching up. Remind you of anything? Remember the geode? As the geode grows, its outer surface spreads in advancing rings, exposing a lower tectonic surface in the exact same way. On the moon, these bunched up areas of upper tectonic surface are the result of a growing tectonic undersurface, a spreading silicate rock surface, a new skin, fresh from the inside of the moon, growing like a crystal geode. According to this theory, this image is the moon about 400 million years ago. The mares exist only in their early primitive stages, much smaller. The mares will grow and expand as you watch. The spreads will grow and the moon grows up to this size. This is our present moon. For careful examination and study or scrutiny, we will go backward in time and watch the mares close down. Remember, we are reducing and enlarging only those gigantic spreads or mares. This has led to a significant and interesting problem. If we say these spreads or mares are eruptive growth from the inside of the moon, and we do, wouldn't the gravitational pull of the Earth exerted on the Earth's side of the moon cause most, if not all, of the growth to erupt toward the Earth? In fact, wouldn't that imply that these eruptive mares should not exist on the side of the moon which faces away from the Earth? This is what the common sense logic says, but let's see what reality says. In fact, as you can see, on this very detailed image, the far side of the moon has virtually no gigantic mares or spreads. Well, there's a suspicious candidate, but you can see it's smallish by comparison to the gigantic spreads on the Earth side of the moon. In fact, the tectonic spreads on the Earth side give the Earth side a totally different look than the far side. This cropped off picture is Mars. I wasn't able to get the whole picture, but this will do for our purposes. The colors from NASA are not true. The colors represent heights, tectonic heights. The highest land is red, down the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. The lowest, newest land is blue. Why do I say newest? because the upper higher land pulled apart and revealed the underland. Call it the newer land. Why newer and how do I know? Actually, all scientists know. Look at the craters. As time goes by for the older land, you get more and more accumulation of craters. This higher red and orange land is older with lots more craters. This green to blue land is newer with far fewer meteor craters. So it's younger. This is the Vales Marineris. I've focused on it because it's the greatest, deepest, and newest rifting and spreading on Mars. 
This rift is as wide as the United States, but you see, as Mars grew, this rift pulled apart all around. This pulling away made a big circle of pulling apart. The relief of this spreading that made this possible is the young, new, blue area. So quite simply, to go back in time, we close back over this blue, young area, and the upper plates will tighten back around this upper veils area, and even the marinaris will close. The blue, young area disappears, covered by the older land. Now we can go forward in time as Mars grows up to today. The blue opens and the land tugs and some pieces break off into, well, islands if there was water. There is no other way that this plate area could come to this configuration unless Mars grew. Thank you. This is Europa, a moon of Jupiter. It has a most incredible surface. Speculation as to its surface composition has included ice, slushy ice, and well, whatever. Doesn't look like ice to me. I don't think ice pushes up ridges like these, but there you go. Whatever it is, the mineral cracks and spreads as Europa grows. This is the latest photo that NASA has supplied to us on the internet. See that gash down the middle? It's a tectonic spread. Actually, NASA seems to think so too, which is, yes, a surprise. Let me show you why a spread is the only proper description for what you see here. First, some small cracks happen more currently than the big spread, so we'll put X's on them to mark them. We know they're newer because they invaded the spread here, 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 and here. The rest of the cracks are older than the spread. I've asked Zia to cut up one side of the spread. Thanks, Z. Now we'll move this side over to the other side and swing the bottom over. Good. All these sides match exactly, so much so that the line that defines the crack disappears. I think anyone can see this clearly. Here's another crack. The land spread up to the right, so let's bring it down and left. There. I believe this is ongoing eruptive silicate growth from the moon's inside. If this isn't growth of this moon, where is this material going? Maybe it's subducting. <laughs> Kidding. Can you spot the break now? No, it's here. Isn't that incredible? The surface area here has been reduced by one quarter or more, and it happens all over this moon. When I saw this photo, I bet myself that the area on the lower right-hand side matched its opposite surface on the upper left-hand side. So let's try it. You can do this experiment yourself using the same photos from NASA. This moon, just like all moons and all planets and all suns and our whole universe, is growing. This is Ganymede, a moon of Jupiter. It has a very distinctive surface. The darker areas are older, higher raised surfaces. How do we know this? First, the darker surfaces have been measured as higher tectonically by the scientific community. Secondly, these darker areas have a greater abundance of meteor hits. More hits equals older surface as we saw on our moon. I realize this process may seem to be thunderingly obvious to you. It's not to the current scientific community and they will certainly not buy it easily. So bear with me. As you can see, we are closing the lower tectonic plates to a very dramatic result. Understand, we are only bringing these upper tectonic surfaces together. The result is we have reduced Ganymede by one-third of its volume. One-third, 30 percent. This just in. When this project began, we had only still photos of Ganymede. Now NASA has a nearly complete map of Ganymede. Some areas are not clear, but for our example, this is terrific. First, we wrap it around a sphere, good. Now we go back in time and watch as the darker plates move together tectonically. 
Boy, isn't this a great map NASA's assembled? Look. Let's pick two sides. And yeah, not spin them. And we'll just watch them go back in time. The dark plates don't shrink, just the sphere and the lower tectonic plates. It's like a puzzle. I promise you, I didn't change anything. Well, you can see for yourself. Many moon surfaces don't show this process as well as others. So I'm consciously choosing the easy ones. I leave it for others in the future to continue this work. Watch this model, please, as we enlarge the planet. The 10 mile thick hardened curved tectonic plates are longer on the top than at the underside because of the curve. When the crust recurves to a less curved state, the upper crust must collapse in a series of wrinkles. Call them mountains. The center of the continent falls straight down, as you can see. Let's go to North America and let the Earth grow. Watch as the surface recurves, collapses, and folds into mountains. This is how we get mountains. Just as mountains wrinkle and fold, the edges of the continents crack and split. This is what these cracks are. The same recurving that makes mountains also creates those continental shelf cracks. The reptiles survived because they didn't migrate. They don't migrate now. Why don't they migrate? Because they have outfacing legs. They live where they live, at the equator. And they buried their eggs. Why didn't reptiles migrate like dinosaurs? Because dinosaurs were evolutionarily superior to them. And that's what killed the dinosaurs. They were better. Reptiles' legs projected outward from their bodies, like their fish ancestors. Dinosaur legs and general anatomy changed so that their legs grew downward. They were more supported by their shoulder, hip, and spine. They could travel the distances to migrate. Dinosaurs were migratory, as their ancestor remnants the birds are, and the opening of the Mediterranean 63 million years ago cut off their migration in Eurasia. Can it be as simple as that? Yes, it can be exactly as simple as that. And it had to be. Only this theory explains the selective destruction of the dinosaurs, and not the mammals or reptiles. Mammals didn't need to migrate, nor did they. They were warm-blooded, they had fur, they carried their eggs inside their bodies, and they fed their young from their bodies. They burrowed into the earth for safety and warmth. They hibernated. They were often nocturnal, and very significantly, they ate eggs that were on the ground. They preyed on dinosaurs. Not grown dinosaurs, but dinosaur eggs. This is Pangaea as described by modern science and geology. All the heavy land masses are on one side of the earth, positioned exactly as proposed by accepted theory. The granitic rock and basalts that make up the massive island weigh nearly three times as much as the ocean water on the opposite side of the earth. The ocean is an average of 2.5 miles deep, or just about 4 kilometers deep. 4 kilometers of water against 4 kilometers of granites and basalt. We add to the Pangaea side an average half mile above sea level of the continent. The Pangaea side is heavily weighted, more than 4 to 1 as a result. This means that the center of gravity of the Earth had to be shifted toward the Pangaea side by four or five kilometers. Water, being opportunistic, will shift with the center of gravity. And this is what would have happened according to the simple, basic physics. As you can see, the middle of Pangaea is sinking beneath the waves. The middle of the gigantic Pacific Ocean's oceanic plate seems to be raising above the ocean's waves as the ocean deserts it. Let's turn the two sides to us. 
The statements made here are straightforward and factual. Anyone can do the math. Nothing is hidden, nothing misstated. This is not the picture that current geology presents to us. If Pangaea ever existed, this is what the Earth had to look like. Life would have developed separately and differently in mid-Pacific than on the ring island of Pangaea, and evidence of such an island would be in existence, and it's not. under the earth and tore away from India. Spreading down from the Arctic and away from North America, Eurasia was still the largest landmass on earth. The recurving of this gigantic landmass created the greatest folding of the upper crust on earth. This folding and mountaining happened just above this new, triangular, broken away peninsula that we call India. If India wasn't hanging down there, northern India would be Asia's coast. This land area was stretched out to the side, just as northern Italy was stretched sideways, because it was on Europe's stretching coast. Down lower, on both India and Italy, the sideways pulling tension ceased and normal recurving, mild mountaining began anew. Finally, Africa began tearing free of Europe. As Africa pulled downward, the mountains draped down over the left side of India. What about the other side? Brings us to Australia. Australia was broken in a long sweeping break from North America and Asia. The break curved inward as it came down Asia. North America pulled away but Australia was held against Asia by Antarctica, which clung in turn to South America and Africa, and then of course Asia. Seems complicated, it's not. Finally, mainland Asia could stand the pressure no longer and it tore a mighty tear, a tear we now call the Yellow Sea. This relieved the pressure on Asia and that lower land was to be forfeit. As Australia pulled down, the land unwound and finally had to bend backward and break into islands, which turned out into the sea. Australia was pulled down inexorably and the mountains angled down Indonesia, with the land folding along the right side of India, folded like cloth folds. Asia also spread from the North Pole it crushed down on India. This is why we have buckled mountains above and to the sides of India. The only true reason. Australia finally tore away from Antarctica 65 million years ago and took its place in the spreading ocean. It isolated the southern marsupial. The marsupial's bigger home, Antarctica, froze over with the arrival of the newly created deep sea plate. The ocean surrounded now Australia which became the one big remaining home for marsupial life. Islands such as Great Britain, Norway, Sweden, and others are broken off chunks that, as with Iceland, still move as the earth grows semi-slowly away from their mainland homes, riding within and on their spreading plates. Do you see how broadly the Pacific is opening compared to the Atlantic? This is exactly why the knee-jerk Pangaea theory exists. The Pacific spread is too difficult to easily visualize because it's so big. The Atlantic spread is so obvious that a child would recognize it, but they are the same. I don't want anyone to think we may have manipulated the earth while the away side circled, so we'll show the Atlantic in its growth first and then the Pacific. Please watch the details. 
It seems so natural because it is so natural. This is how it happened. We were very, very strict in our rules and the way we followed them. Besides no subduction and no turning and no enlarging, reducing and deforming, we went much further. We followed the undersea tectonic maps that are commonly accepted. As the left pulled, well, leftward, the top of the continent was pulling free of the other side of Eurasia and, of course, Greenland. As a result, these islands broke off and strung out like beads on a string. As a result of this pulling apart, there is a massively weakened and stretched out U-shaped area of land. It's demarked down the left by these lakes, which are stretch marks. On the right side is the St. Lawrence Seaway. Examine how clear it is that this area has been pulled up and out of this right side. And the explosive focus of this eruptive pulling is the Great Lakes. You may have been taught in school that the Great Lakes and other lakes were carved out by glaciers. This is simply not true. When we go backward in time, the St. Lawrence Seaway will reclose as we expect. More significantly, as all this happens, the Great Lakes will close. And as we go forward in time, the eruptive spreading of the land moving apart tears open and creates the Great Lakes at this key focal point. This is the origin of the Great Lakes. NASA, using radar scanning devices, has mapped the tectonic heights and depths of Mars' surface. By assigning colors to the various heights, a clearer picture emerges. Lower land is blue, then up to green, then yellow, orange, then red, and magenta. Finally, a pinkish gray. Here, yes. I don't know about you, but I think this is fantastic. It's the Grateful Dead version of Mars. By separating the levels with colors, we are almost invited to slide these layers of plates together. As you know, these indeed are plates, that is layers, like slate, like a cake, capable of being slid or moved apart and over each other when under strong pressure. If we move these layers back together, will the levels be assembled with each other? Let's slide these levels together and see. See if the colors reassemble on their levels. A warning, this couldn't happen unless Mars grew. Let's go forward in time. Now a comparison. The lower tectonic plate, the blue plate, begins back in time hidden, only to be revealed as a new lower plate. With, as you can see, no new craters. Am I tricking you and finagling with this map? Nope. You can see it clearly. You can see what we're doing frame by frame. Let's do <laughs> the whole planet next. Greetings, guys and gals. This is Neil Adams. I've been talking about the incredible Tasmanian geologist Samuel Warren Carey for eight or so years now. Sam, who in the 1960s wrote his first book on what he called the expanding Earth. Well, as it turns out, he did make a video. Naturally, being a geologist and without all the answers, he used the term expanding Earth and not growing Earth. The point is, Earth has gotten vastly larger in the last 180 million years, twice as big in circumference and five times bigger in mass and volume. No, I was never first in all this. My contribution is the physics part and the animation. So, without further ado, here's Sam Carey. In 1956, he sponsored the highly successful Continental Drift Symposium at the University of Tasmania. This symposium helped stimulate interest in continental drift after decades of neglect or even contempt by the majority of geologists. He believed then, as now, 
that continents moved as a response to expansions of the Earth. But did he always believe that the Earth has expanded? No, only during the last quarter of a century. During the 30s and 40s and 50s, I taught what you now call plate tectonics. I took for granted that the Earth's uh, diameter was constant. It hadn't occurred to me anything else. But if I'd only known it, in Germany, uh, Lindemann had published his book on the expanding Earth in 1928, and uh, uh, Hilgenberg in 1932, and uh, Kindle in 1940. But these weren't translated into English. They weren't translated until I translated them uh, 20 years ago. But as I worked, I got increasing difficulty in putting the pieces together on a bigger and bigger area. You must remember that I was make, working more accurately than my contemporaries. Uh, I calculated hundreds, hundreds of uh, bleak stereographic projections, all by logarithms, there were no computers in those days, and uh, I made comparisons on my hemispherical table. No matter how often I tried, I could never get all the continents to go together on the whole globe. Even with these, which fit so nicely, there's still a more small gap there. But uh, as I put more and more pieces on, the gaps accumulated and I got a very large gap. I didn't realise that my trouble was that my table matched my globe and not a smaller globe, which was the proper globe for that time. As difficulties increased, and I gradually became convinced that the plate tectonic model which fits so well for these two continents, won't work for the whole globe. Then there's the problem of the Pacific Ocean. When you put all the continents together on Pangaea, Pangaea spits, spills over a hemisphere. Uh, here is Wegener's 1915 version of it. Seventy years ago, Wegener pioneered continental drift, and the translation of his book from German in 1924 burst like a bomb among astonished English-speaking geologists. Wegener's map is an Eitoff projection of the whole globe, as though you cut the globe along the back and pulled the sides out and flattened it. Flattening, of course, pulls things out of shape. And this line is, in fact, the correct hemisphere on this projection. You can see that Wegener's Pangaea spills over the hemisphere just a little. Here is my version of it from 1945, 30 years after Wegener, drawn on a stereographic projection which shows only one hemisphere. Here again, uh, Pangaea is just a little more than a hemisphere. And here, another 25 years later, is the 1970 version by the Americans, Bob Dietz and John Holden, using a similar projection to Wegener's and plotted by computer. Again, you see that Pangaea is just uh, a little more than the hemisphere. So everybody agrees that uh, Pangaea was just a little bit more than the hemisphere. Therefore, the Pacific, which was on the other side, was just a little bit less than the hemisphere. Everybody that has put the continents together on a globe of the present size to, finds that Pangaea has spilled over a hemisphere just a bit. That means that the ancestor of the Pacific on the other side of the globe must have been just a little bit less than the hemisphere. But since then, uh, Pangaea has greatly increased in size by the opening of the Arctic and opening of the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean and Southern Ocean, so that what was Pangaea is now nearly doubled in size. That means that the Pacific should have been reduced nearly to, well, nearly to zero. But the Pacific is still nearly a hemisphere. Now, that's absurd unless the Earth's greatly expanding. Now, on Pangaea, this point was close up to that point, so that this part of the Pacific Rim has increased by over a thousand kilometres. Likewise, Antarctica was nudging Madagascar on Pangaea. That means that that part of the Pacific Rim has increased by a couple of thousand kilometres. Likewise, Australia was right up against Antarctica, and the ocean between has, has opened by 3,000 kilometres. Now, when you add them all up right round the Pacific, you'll find that the rim of the Pacific has greatly increased in length. That means that the area of the Pacific has greatly increased. But according to plate theory, and to take in the increase of uh, Pangaea, the Pacific 
uh, should have greatly decreased. This is absurd unless the Earth is greatly expanded. Then you've got the floors of the ocean. They're all very young. Very little of it is older than 100 million years anywhere in the world. None older than 200 million years. And that's only a twentieth of the age of the Earth. Where are the old ocean floors? The plate people say that they've been subducted. Did they ever really exist? Fossil and paleomagnetic evidence shows that the Permian Equator went through Texas and, uh, and New York. And at the same time, the Permian Equator was just south of France. Now, that means that uh, North America has moved up by uh, 35 degrees towards the Arctic since the Permian, and Europe has gone up by 40 degrees towards the Arctic, and the same way, uh, Siberia has moved up by 20 degrees. So, here we have a position of all the continents converging on the Arctic by 5,000 kilometers, which should have squeezed the Arctic by that amount. Was the Arctic squeezed that time? No. Through all that time, the Arctic has been a tension expanding area. The same impossibility comes quite independently from the Triassic, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Plate people claim that the Himalayas, or Himalayas if you say it that way, were formed by the movement of India 5,000 kilometres northwards to shove into Asia, folding up the Himalayas and opening the Indian Ocean behind. Two facts prove this wrong. First, the Paleozoic and Mesozoic strata in the Himalayas, Tibet, Siberia, Afghanistan and in Iran, all show that there was no ocean between India and the rest of Asia, only shallow intracontinental seas with similar fossils and rock types spreading right across. This Triassic reptile, whose lifestyle was like a hippopotamus, walked from India to China and back again along with many others. Do you think this possible if there were 5,000 kilometers of ocean between? No. India was no further from China then than now. The great folding and orogenesis and uplift of the Himalayas did not commence until the Miocene, whereas the opening of the Indian Ocean commenced 150 million years before that and was largely complete before the Miocene. Plate tectonics can't explain the Himalayas. The paleogeography is all wrong, the timing is all wrong. This is a map of the Atlantic seaboard of North America, from uh, uh, Florida up to Greenland. Now, the fossils of the lower Paleozoic in here are so very different from the fossils on this side of the line, the, even the same age and in the same environment, these are so different that Everybody agrees that they couldn't have been close together like that uh, at the time they lived. So the plate tectonics people require that this line represents a wide ocean and that, the, that these rocks were way over here, some thousands of kilometres away, and eventually closed with the swallowing of the whole ocean along that line. So that line is all that is left of the ancient ocean. Now, if this were true, when the continents were separated, these rocks would record their pole, and these rocks would record their pole, which would be the same pole. And uh, as the continents moved together, those poles would move apart by the amount of the motion and in the direction of the motion. Now, do we find that? No, in fact, we don't. We find a wide separation, but separation is in the direction of the suture. Not, not closing like that, but moving along this suture. Now, before that uh, suture was moved, England was right down here, very close to where Florida is now. And Florida and the Maritime Province rocks were still further along in that direction. Now, the motion was that England moved right up here, 5,000 kilometers to that position. And it brought these rocks in close contact with those. The closure along this suture was not due to the motion of two continents together, as tectonics people claim, but the movement along the suture. As I said before, all the ocean crust is a very young age. Now, if we take, them, take that crust out, 
to see what it was like before, we find that all the continents will completely enclose an Earth half the diameter with no oceans at all. Now when Dr. Embleton and Dr. Schmidt of the CSIRO were studying the paleomagnetism of the Proterozoic rocks some 2,000 million years ago, they found to their surprise that the continents were in the same radial position as they are now. In other words, the continents have moved apart, not by sliding on the surface, but by moving out radially. Now, that is exactly what my friend uh, Klaus Vogel of East Germany found when he fitted the continents together on a small globe inside a transparent outer globe of the present-day Earth. As he progressively eliminated the oceans, the continents converged as they went back in along the radius and fitted together on a globe half the size, enclosing it completely. Now, Dr. Andrew Dixon, a geochemist of the Bureau of Mineral Resources in Canberra, has been studying the missing Archean crust. Missing only if you assume that the Earth has always had its present diameter and always had the great oceans. But Dr. Glickson concluded that it was not missing, that the present crust was uh, all there was of continental crust and fitted together on a small Earth. Dr. Keith, Keith Crook of the Australian National University has drawn attention to the lack of ocean-type sedimentation before the Paleozoic. This could mean the lack of oceanic environments before the Paleozoic. In other words, the great oceans as we now know them didn't exist until fairly recent times. Of course, most geologists do reject ideas of Earth expansion, but in fact, very few of them have studied it. This is not surprising because when you come to think of it, no scientist could possibly read even the abstracts of all the papers in his own field. And because uh, Earth expansion has been generally discarded, these are the first papers which they don't read. Uh, Dr. Peter Smith of the Open University in Britain polled a large number of geologists and he found that not one of them had studied my book on Earth expansion. Of course, some have studied it and some have risen to defend the orthodox views. Uh, some point out, for example, that if all the continents were brought together and so that the Earth was half its present diameter, then the weight of objects on the surface would be four times their present weight. Well, uh, Dr. Stewart, or Professor Stewart is of Reading University, has demonstrated that the gravity force on the surface of the Earth could not have been as much as that. But Professor Stewart's argument assumes that the mass of the Earth has been constant. Well, has it? I don't think so. I think that all matter in the universe grows at a rate depending on some power of pressure and time. Then others point out that uh, if the Earth was shrunk to half its diameter with only the continents, they would be drowned to great depth by all the ocean water. There'd be no land surface at all. But this assumes that the water was always there, was it? I don't think so. At a very early stage in the Earth's history, the Earth lost all its water, all its gases, all its vapors. And our present atmosphere and the present oceans have accumulated through geological time, partly from emanations from volcanoes, but mostly from the new volcanic ro rocks coming up on the ocean floor for the growth of the oceans. So that there's a direct link there. The volume of ocean waters has kept in step with the area of the oceans. Some have asked, why is it that the Earth of all the planets is the only one that shows expansion? But if you look, they all do. Take Mercury. Mercury has a polygonal fracture pattern of a couple of hundred kilometers, which is exactly what I think the Earth was like at that time. That's just what the expanding Mercury should have been like at that stage of its development. And now Mars, this great equatorial rift zone on Mars, is exactly what I think the Earth was like 2,000 million years ago. 
then the asymmetry of all the planets and of the moon, I think it, that is due to their expansion. Some critics have pointed out that if the Earth was expanding, the number of days in a year should increase as the rate of rotation uh, slowed down. Well now, fossil corals and some other animals have growth lines, some of which are thought to be daily, and some of which are thought to be monthly, and some annual, like tree rings. Now, if you count the number of daily ones between the annual ones, you shouldn't know the number of days in the year. Well, now this has been estimated, and I say estimated because the daily ones are so very, very fine that it's hard to be sure whether you've missed three or four here at various places. And nevertheless, it's quite true that there were many more days in the Devonian year than at present. But that has been interpreted in terms of the tidal drag of the moon slowing down the Earth. But these calculations depend on the assumption that the mass of the Earth has been constant. And as we've already said, I doubt that this is true. Paleomagneticians have also tried to estimate the ancient radius of the Earth by measuring how far various paleo latitudes were from the pole of the time. Now, individual results scatter very, very widely, but by combining a large number of them, we hope statistically to get the correct result. Well, now, the error here is not so much in the statistics, but in the assumption that as a continent flattens to a larger radius Earth, that the angles to the pole remain constant. You all know that the angles of a plain triangle add up to 180 degrees. But the three angles of a triangle on the surface of a sphere add up to something between 180 degrees and 540 degrees, according to the ratio of the size of the triangle to the radius. Hence, the angle between two meridians of longitude painted on the surface of a continent, each pointing to the pole, would get smaller as the Earth expands and still point to the more distant pole, thus continuously cancelling the evidence that the Earth is expanding. Still larger errors come from the map projections used by the paleomagneticians for their calculations. When you make a map of the spherical surface on a flat paper, shapes must distort severely. You can't flatten a sphere without distorting something. You can draw a map so that all the areas are correct, but only with great distortion of shape. Or you can draw a map to keep shapes correct, but the areas are way out. Or you can have the angle and distance from one central point correct, but both shapes are wrong, as on this one. Uh, this uh, quadrangle here has the same area and shape as that one in there, although they're different on the projection. In drawing the continents, you have a wide choice. But the expanding Earth did its own thing, and you've got no choice at all. It didn't hold angles strictly correct, it didn't hold shapes strictly correct, or areas strictly, strictly correct. But the paleomagneticians, they started off by using an azimuthal equidistant projection, which has quite large er errors as you move away from the centre. They improved a bit by using an azimuthal equal area projection, but still the errors are large and especially away from the centre, and their computer program biases in favour of the points furthest away from the centre. And the uh, paramagneticians claim that their results prove that the Earth is not expanding. But in addition to these geometrical errors, they ignore all the billions of fractures, large ones and small ones, right on down to the smallest joints. Now, if each joint only yielded by one thousandth of a degree. You could accumulate 10 degrees of error in one kilometre. It's all like this picture puzzle of the vanishing square. Here we have two identical rectangles, 12 squares by 5 squares. And this orange triangle is the same as this one. And this blue triangle, which is five, uh, 7 by 3, is the same as this one, which is 7 by 3. And this green one 
which is five by two, and same as this green one, which is five by two, and this uh, purple area with five underneath and two on top, is the same as this purple area with five underneath and two on top, and this yellow one with five on top and two underneath, is the same as this one with five on top and two underneath. Where does the black one go to? Well, it's very simple. If you look at it very closely, you'll see that the tangent of that angle is 2 over 5, and the tangent of that angle is 3 over 7, which is not quite the same. And in fact, there are 12 little tiny pieces that are ignored just along there, and they add up to the area of the black square. By ignoring billions of tiny adjustments like this, the paleomagneticians claim to have proved that the Earth is not expanding. In this, they join uh, Harold Jeffries and George Gaylord Simpson and Bailey Willis, three of the great leaders in their own fields who ridiculed continental drift and by their very prestige delayed the acceptance of continental drift for some decades. Expansion is just one step forward in the progress from early Greek science, when everybody knew of their flat Earth in the centre of the great universe with the moon and the sun and the stars and the planets all going round the Earth. Then uh, Pythagoras, about 600 BC, was the first to prove to himself that the Earth was a sphere. But Zeno, his successor, laughed at such a silly idea. Uh, think of the people underneath with their feet uh, pointing upwards and the rain falling upwards. How silly. By 300 BC, Aristarchus of Samos was the first to show, to his satisfaction, that far from being the centre, the Earth itself went around the Sun, which was the centre, along with all the planets and the stars. But uh, Ptolemy, he proved with a very good formulae whereby he could predict the paths of planets. He proved that no, the Earth was the centre and moon and sun and planets all went around the Earth. And this view prevailed for another 2,000 years until Copernicus re-established what Aristarchus had known two millennia before him. And he knew he lost his head for it. It was into this century when people all knew that the continents were fixed on the face of the Earth. And it's only in the uh, 60s that it's generally been accepted that the continents have moved over the surface of the Earth relative to each other, even though Wegener knew this 50 years before. And now it's 50 years since Hilgenberg and uh, Lindemann knew that the Earth was expanding. And now it's your turn to realize that the Earth is expanding. May I quote from Alexander Pope? Be thou the first true merit to befriend, his praise is lost who stays till all commend.